Hi, my name is Michael Hudson and I run Belmont Learning Centers. Um, there are three learning centers all here to help our Belmont students and that includes you, our graduate students. But today we are here to talk about graduate level reading. I really wish there was a word other than reading for what you're about to do in your graduate classes because it is like reading in a way that you have never done before. So let's start thinking about reading as though it's information transfer and not just reading. It's conversations that we're having with the text. So I want to put out there, I'm not about to make this easier on you. I'm about to make it more efficient. Um, there is no way to do easy graduate school. If it was easy, everyone would do it. So here we go. So the first thing you want to keep in mind as you work. So the first thing you want to keep in mind as you go through your reading is your environment, right? So where are you doing this reading? You want to make sure that it's well lit. You want to think about noise level. Are you a person who needs noise? Are you a person who needs absolute quiet? There is no one right noise level. The goal is not to fall asleep. So whatever you need to do to not fall asleep, um, that's your noise level. That's your sweet spot. Uh, then you need snacks. I'm going to suggest that you not choose snacks that are going to make the pages greasy, that are going to make you uncomfortable or bloated or thirsty but you start with snacks so you have no excuse but to stay there, right? We've all been in that situation where we're reading and then we realize, oh, we're thirsty or, oh, we're hungry. No, you're not. You just don't want to sit there and read. So <laughs> sit down, already ready to go with snacks. You want to be comfortable but not comfy. If you could fall asleep in that position, it's not a good position to study in. Don't study on your bed. Make sure you're in a comfortable chair. Make sure you have good back support. Make sure that you are comfortable, but not so comfy that you easily fall asleep or get distracted. Um, I like to have what's known as super secret reading time. If you tell someone you're reading who's not in graduate school, what they're going to hear is, I'm not doing anything. I'm just kind of hanging out. So if I say, I never say I'm reading tonight. I say I have homework. I say I have work to do, but whatever you need to do to make it so that you're not disturbed over and over again by your phone, you could put it on airplane mode, just saying, but if you can't bear not to have access to your phone, then at least communicate that what you're doing is, is important to the people that you know. And the last thing is to read with your pen. Um, I see so many students reading with highlighters and it's just not a good look. The first thing you want to do is read with your pen and we'll discuss why later, but you start with the pen and then you use the highlighter. One of the reasons you do this is so that we don't end up with pages like this one, right? So I'm sure that this looks familiar to you where the whole page is highlighted. There may be like one or two little portions that aren't highlighted, but who is this helping? What's highlighting if everything's highlighting? right? This is coloring. It's not highlighting and it's not useful. So first start with your pen and then we'll talk about how to use your highlighter in an appropriate way that's actually effective later. So to achieve mastery of a particular text, you must read it at least three times. You may have to read it more, but there's just no way you're going to get mastery at a graduate level unless you read it at least three times. So what do those three times look like? So the first time you read, you're just going to put question marks by the things you don't know. The second time you read, you're going to take those question marks and you're going to write them out into actual questions, right? Uh, and then the third time you read, you're going to write out answers to those questions. Um, now, there are some tips and tricks within these, and we're going to talk about those later. But those are the three basic steps, right? The first time, ask questions. The second time, write those questions out. And the third time, make answers to those questions. Now, this is where the highlighter comes in. Step four. That's why it's three kind of steps to mastery. If you are still confused about an issue after these three steps, now you highlight it, right? Now you say, I don't know this, so I really need to put a focus on it. That's how you use your highlighter. So some tips for step one. You want to survey. So over there you have spoiler alert. Start at the end of the book. Start at the end with the chapter review. Start with the discussion questions. Look up any words in bold before you start reading. 
what you're doing is sort of creating a scaffolding for all that new information to go on, right? So before you read it the first time, do a little survey of the book and see what's important. Look at the charts. Make note of anything that has a picture or that's reinforced or bold or anything like that. So before you start to read, you want to survey. The second thing you want to do is have no judgment of yourself. If that page is finished and it is nothing but question marks, who cares? We're just on step one and we don't know it. So we're just going to put question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. We're not going to judge ourselves for it. We're just going to accept it. And it's okay. It's step one, right? And if you knew it coming in, if you knew it before reading it, you wouldn't be here, right? You'd have your doctorate. You'd be done. So no judgment is really key in this step. The third thing is no mercy, right? If you even kind of don't understand, put that question mark there. You want to attack the book with question marks, right? No mercy for the book. It's not alive. It'll be fine. It'll make it. So ask all the questions you want. Remember when we started, we talked about information transfer. It's not reading. It's information transfer. It's me having a conversation with the text. So if I have a question about the text, I'm going to ask that question. I'm not going to try to be polite and hold my question back. And then finally, take breaks. Your brain is not going to be able to read these types of text for two, three hours at a time. Read for 45 minutes, take a five to 10 minute break. Read for another 45 minutes, take a five to 10 minute break. The break should not be on the internet. Um, I don't know about you, but I will fall down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. I will fall down a TikTok link so fast. Uh, and I look up and an hour has passed. So you want to take breaks, but you want to be smart with what you do with your breaks. You want to stretch, you want to move, you want to get a snack, you want to get something to drink. You might want to answer some emails, but you really, really, really don't want to do those sort of time traps like Instagram or TikTok or anything like that. You want to avoid those if at all possible. So there are three types of questions that make academic articles a bit different from your book, okay? So the types of questions you want to ask with academic articles are questions of understanding, questions of context, and questions of implication. In your book, you're largely just going to have questions of understanding, right? I don't understand this. I don't understand this. I don't understand this. There may be some questions of implications um, that you have when you're using your textbook, but usually the textbook has already provided context, right? So be thinking it's not just one type of question. I'm not just trying to understand as a student so that I can pass a class. I am trying to understand as a scholar so that I can add to the scholarship and do this for a living. So what's that look like? So here I have an academic article about um, inequity and health disparities in pharmacy. So if you can see what I've done here is after the first page, I've just started to put question marks and underlines what I'm asking the questions about, right? No highlighter, just underlining and question marks. That's it. See how clean that is? See how I can keep reading and I'm not really disturbed by my question marks? But if you notice, as we go forth, the question marks have words beside them. So if it's just a plain question mark, it's just I don't understand it. But sometimes it's a question mark of context, right? I don't know where this is coming from. I don't understand why they're making this assertion. Is this something that I need to know? Or if they reference another article and I'm interested in what that article is, that's also a question of context, right? So up here, I just underlined a name. I don't know what that article is, but they say it's important. So maybe I should know about it. And then for academic articles, particularly ones that do research, you're also going to find sort of um, these questions of implication in the discussion questions, right? So my question marks when they are presenting their results are all about the larger implications of the things that they find. Because some articles are really great about talking to you about that, but some aren't, right? Some more tips for step two. During step two, when you're writing out the questions, because now you have your question marks, right? So now you're writing out your questions. As you write out your questions, you need to start making connections between the themes, right? I don't have to fully understand to know that it's connected to something else. This is how our brains work, right? 
First, we assimilate new knowledge. We just kind of have it there. And then our brains make new connections between old and new things. That's called deep learning. And that's how learning sticks. So you can't just go through and say, this is by itself, this is by itself, this is by itself. As you write out a question, you definitely want to make sure that you understand how that connection, how that question, even if you don't know the answer, is related to something that you've already learned. Also during step two, as you start to write these questions out, you might want to start having conversations with people who also know things, right? So there's two ways that you can have these conversations. You can choose someone who knows nothing, who will ask you good questions and sort of spark, well, what are, what does that mean? What do you, and then you know kind of where you're going. Because sometimes with really complex, complex issues, we know we're confused, but we can't put our finger quite on why isn't this sticking? And sometimes getting a lay person to talk to us about it is a really good way to figure out, oh, that's the hole in my knowledge. That's what I actually don't know. And that happened two chapters ago. So I got to make sure I know that. when I, and, and lay people will ask you questions about those small things and you'll realize, oh, that's that's the gap in my knowledge. It's not actually this thing. It's something from before. You can also talk it out with your fellow students, right? Uh, learning is social. You got to make sure that you're doing it with someone. You're having good conversations. And keep in mind, we're still just looking for that information transfer. We're not concerned that we still have these questions. We're just writing them out and having conversations about them. So again, no judgment should be on here as well. But really, conversation is where we're at now. Conversation and connection is how we should think about what's going on. Context is also about making those connections. Where does this fit in the grand scheme of things? How is this building? These are the way you should be thinking about your questions as a scholar at this level, right? And we're still just writing out questions. And still with this part, you're going to need to take breaks. You're going to need to take timeouts, okay? So your timeouts can be a little bit longer because you're going to be talking um, as you're asking these questions, as you're writing them out. But just keep in mind that breaks do not mean divergences. You can take a break from reading and still be thinking about pharmacy. So make sure that your breaks are useful breaks and not simply just turning off your brain for a moment. Though breaks like that are useful as well. So here's where it gets fun. So the third time you read doesn't actually have to be reading. Remember, reading is information transfer. And however you have to get the answer to those questions we're going to call that the third read. Now, some people can absolutely read, no problem, that third time and find those answers to those questions, right? That's fantastic. We love it when that happens. But some people need to do something else and some people need to do multiple things. So one way you can answer the question is by making a model, right? I don't understand how this mechanism connects to this mechanism. How do I answer that question? I make a model of it, right? With stuff like aluminum foil or tape or cheap Play-Doh, it doesn't really matter. Another way to answer the questions that you've written out from step two is with the study group. Um, I don't get it. Maybe my teammate gets it. Maybe my study group partner gets it. And that's how you can answer the questions, right? Remember, it's about the information. It's not about the task. How do I get the information in the best way possible? A third way is with office hours. You have a fantastic resource sitting right in front of you, standing right in front of you, sitting in an office, waiting for you to talk to them. Use office hours wisely, right? Use office hours to make these answers to these questions that you may still have. Now, granted, by the time you read the third time, you may actually understand it. That third read may say, oh, I can just cross this question out. I actually do understand this now. Just like that second read, you might be like, oh, okay, I can get rid of that question mark because I understand that now. So don't think that every question mark will end up as a question, that every question will end up as something with an answer. Because as you read, you will be getting more and more of this information um, just sort of organically, right? The uh, fourth way to read to answer the questions is with videos. So look up videos on the issues that confuse you. Here's the thing about videos. You cannot just find one video and say, that's the answer. You're going to have to look up two or three videos to make sure that there's a strong consensus about what the answer is. We all know 
that the internet is not a place for great truths, right? So you're going to have to dig a little deeper if you use videos to make sure that the answer you find is indeed the correct answer. You can use recordings. You should record yourself reading the second time through as you're writing those questions out. And then you might want to listen to yourself as that third quote unquote read so that you can hear yourself saying the answers. Lots of people learn this way. It's a really useful way to use downtime in the car. If you have a long commute, it's a good way to use wait times in grocery stores and all sorts of ways to like really maximize your time, right? So record yourself reading, listen to it back and try to use that as a way to answer the questions that you've written out from step two. And finally, flashcards. So you contain the questions that you've written out in step two to flashcards in the third way and for three, you answer on the back. So the thing that you want to really understand about step three is what you created as a study guide, right? Because you've written all the things you didn't know in step two, and now you're answering all the things that you don't know in step three. So those answers are now, this is what I need to focus on because this is what confuses me. And I don't have to be overwhelmed by the book anymore because I have created a guide for myself of what I actually don't understand. So here's the thing about the three times. The three times are not studying. They're not the same thing. Three times does provide mastery. It provides a well-rounded view of what's presented, but review will still be necessary to get the sort of results that you want, right? So the three times are a minimum. The three times are a minimum before you study of how you even know how to interact with the text, how you know what types of questions to ask professors when you go in, it's really important that you establish yourself as a scholar in these classes, and that's what the three times does. But as a stellar academic student, that still requires studying. So the best way to think of it is LeBron James still goes to basketball practice, right? Even though he's mastered basketball, he's still got to review those skills. He's still got to sharpen things. That is about the extent I know about basketball, but I know that that is true. So you've got your three times, you've got your study guide, you've got your questions written out, you've got your answers to your questions. Look at all the things that you have created, models and recordings and flashcards. You have created innumerable study guides by this point to help yourself really understand the material. But it's three times for reading just for mastery and then you have to study. Step four in the highlighter. Now, if we have gotten to this point, if you are studying and you are looking at this and you're like, I still don't get it. I still don't understand. That's when we highlight, right? We highlight the things that are quote unquote impossible to understand, not just the things that are important. You're going to be pharmacists. You're going to be affecting people's lives and health. Everything is important. So you highlight the things that feel really loose in your understanding. That's where you really want to focus your highlighting. Um, it, it's really important to make sure that you understand that. And then you want to take anything highlighted straight to your professors. Skip the video, skip the study group, anything that you're like, I got nothing. I really can't understand this. You want to take straight to your professor. So remember, we highlight the quote unquote impossible, not the important. And finally, this doesn't necessarily have to do with reading. It's just a good way to help yourself be a scholar is to create your own scholar cloud, right? Anytime you use an academic article, anytime an academic article is assigned to you, you want to keep all of that information in, a, in one place, right? Everything that you're doing now is connected to something else. So you want to use the, you can use Google Cloud or you can use a file folder that's just on your computer. Even if you don't keep the articles themselves, if you just keep a citation from each of the articles, you will be amazed at how much better it will make like final large projects or even your future as a, as a pharmacist. It will make it so much easier because things will start ringing bells and you'll be like, I know I read that somewhere. And you can just go straight back to it instead of wondering. And what I like to call this is like a study space. My scholar cloud makes my study space. And my study space is a place that I can explore on my own time, 
for my own reasons, but it really does enhance the experience of the classroom. I hope this has been helpful. Um, I know that it seems like a lot, but grad school is a lot, and I wish you all the best of luck.